strongly dominant, if it's actually better than SI prime in all cases, it's a dominant strategy, then we would say that SI prime is strongly dominated, right? But this is weakly dominated. There's lots and lots of situations where player I should be indifferent between playing SI prime and SI double prime, but there's just one or two situations where if the other player does this weird quirky thing, it's a good idea. And it doesn't necessarily have to be weird and quirky. It just means that it's not always the best idea to do SI double prime. It's just never a bad idea, right? And sometimes it's a good idea. And so this is sort of a, a sort of math notation way of saying that, right? If the utility that you get from playing SI double prime against anything that your opponent does is always at least as big as playing SI prime against anything that your opponent does, and strictly bigger than playing SI prime for at least one possible strategy that your opponent could have pursued, then we say that SI prime is weakly dominated. And what that means is that if you're trying to figure out strategically the right thing to do, you can rule out strategies that are weakly dominated, right? If you think that somebody would not, why, I mean, if you think that, that another player would not play a strategy that's weakly dominated, then you can rule that strategy out for them and you can make the game simpler. So for example, whoops, where am I on this? What, what's going, oh, I know what's going on. This is one of these weird, I forgot, this sort of uber animated thing. Okay, so here's player one. Here's player two. So player one, this game is completely abstract. Player one can play up or down, player two can play left, middle, or right. Playing right for player two is dominated by playing middle, right? So no matter what one does, up or down, playing right is, uh, playing middle is better than playing right, because two is bigger than one, and one is bigger than zero. So no matter whether player one goes up or down, player two should never play right, because it will always be better for them to play middle. Yeah? And so a rational player two won't do it, and a player one who knows that player uh, two is rational knows that player two won't play it, and so we just cross that out of the game matrix, okay? Now, once we cross that out, then it turns out that no matter what player two does, player one over here, playing down is dominated by playing up, right? No matter what player two does over here, playing up, we have one is greater than zero, and over here, one is greater than zero here. So playing down is never a good idea for player one once they know that playing right is never a good idea for player two. And so we can, uh, we can cross out down, and then the game becomes uh, very simple, right? Um, because, uh, because two is bigger than zero. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's nice. We went from a game that would have been, there was no dominant strategies, uh, but there were dominated strategies, right? Playing right isn't, doesn't dominate, sorry, playing middle for player two does not dominate playing left, but because it dominates playing right, we can rule right out. Okay, and so then we can make a prediction about what the players will play, and it has some of the same intuitive appeal, which is you can imagine people actually logicking their way through the game step by step like that and actually coming to that answer. You know, uh, I can easily imagine people not logicking their way through, because I am absolutely hopeless at strategic calculations like this. If you ever want to get the better of me, just suggest that we you know, get together for soda and play a strategic game. Um, because I will, I will think I'm going to enjoy it, and then I will get hosed. So, like, you know, Settlers of Catan, forget it. I love the colored little game pieces. I'm terrible at the game. So let's think about whether or not the assumptions necessary to believe in iterated dominance as a solution strategy are reasonable, okay? What do we need to assume? First, we need to know that player two won't play R. Sorry, in order to know that player, R won't play, that player two won't play R, we need to assume that two is rational. We also need to assume that they don't care about the other player's payoffs, but we need to know that they're rational um, and that they actually can do some simple math and figure things out and not shoot themselves in the foot, okay? Is that enough to actually eliminate R? No. To eliminate it from the game, we also have to assume that one that knows that two is rational, right? Because we don't cross it out because player two won't play it. We cross it out because player one knows two won't play it and therefore can ignore it in making their own choices. Uh, and then to eliminate D, which was the next thing we did here, we have to assume that two knows one is rational and that two knows one knows two is rational. Right? Which is just one of those things that rapidly becomes annoying. And this is a simple game. Two players, one, of, you know, one with two actions and one with three actions. And already we're getting into this, well, I know that you know that I know. Right? So this is what's called common knowledge of rationality. And already it starts to seem a little bit strained but you will, you will find in game theory, if you haven't already, that there are all kinds of games that are solved, uh, that, that, that to, to get the solution, you actually have to assume that people have many, many, many more levels of assumption of rationality. I know that you know that you know that I know that blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Well, because if one thinks that R is not rational, then one can't be sure that, one, that two will never play R, and therefore can't, can't rule R out as a possibility. Suppose that one believes that player two rolls a three-sided die, die before deciding whether to go left, middle, or right, right? Um, then the fact that a rational player two would never play right doesn't enter into player one's calculations. And in fact, that's exactly the model we're going to look at in, in a couple of weeks, right after Thanksgiving, is what if player one thinks that player two plays randomly? Because he'd be surprised how many people play in ways that either look like random or look like they think other people are random. Did that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Then we step up to Nash equilibrium. Many games are not solvable either by dominant strategies or iterated deletion of dominated strategies. Okay? So here's the classic battle of the sexes. And what do we have? We have player one likes to go to the opera more than they like to go to football, but they really what they like is to go to whichever thing they do with player two. Player two, meanwhile, likes to go to football. Is that, am I getting this right? If they go together, yeah, player one likes going to the opera together best, and player two likes going to football together. So if you're a Berkeley economist, you're obliged to make this the guy and this the woman. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, I, had, I did the version of this a year or so ago where I had um, George W. Bush and, um, and uh, Tony Blair deciding whether it was, I called it Meet Me on the Battlefield, and it was deciding whether to invade Iraq or Afghanistan. And Tony Blair preferred Afghanistan, uh, and, and George W. Bush preferred Iraq, but ultimately they wanted to invade together. And so I, I dodged around the gender connotation um, and satisfied my obsession with war. Okay, so what goes on in the Battle of the Sexes? Um, 
So you, uh, it should be obvious from this that there's no dominant strategy, right? If, if two goes to, they don't plan in advance. They just show up together without any consultation. And, and, and if two goes to the opera, then it's best for one to go to the opera. But if two goes to football, it's best for one to go to football. And so there's no dominant, and it's a symmetrical game. So there's no dominant strategies, and there's no dominated strategies. Right, so then what we do is, and this is how John Nash uh, won the Nobel Prize, um, I believe, was he came along and he said, look, a strategy profile, S star, which includes player one and player two strategies, is a Nash equilibrium if each player's strategy is their best response to the other player's strategy. Right? So the utility of playing S I star, given that the other person is playing S minus I star, is better than playing anything else you could do, given that the other player is playing S I star, all right? for all possible alternatives and for all players in the game. So given what everybody is actually playing in a particular equilibrium, nobody could have done better by doing something else, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best outcome for everybody. It just means that no individual in the game can independently deviate from that equilibrium and do better for themselves. Right? So if, if two play, goes to the opera, then one wants to go to the opera. Whoops, come back. And if one goes to the opera, then two wants to go to the opera, which makes that a Nash equilibrium. If they're both going to the opera, then it's optimal for each of them to be going to the opera. If they're both already at the op opera, it's not a good idea for either of them to get up and leave and go to football, even if one of them happens to prefer football. And the same is true for both of them going to football. Okay? So we have solved the problem of what would be an equilibrium thing for people to do if there was no dominant strategies or dominated strategies. But we created this absolutely horrible dilemma for ourselves, which is that this solution concept does not predict the actual outcome. Right? And this is, for most of you, will be the first and perhaps only place in economics where you see a much heralded Nobel Prize winning model of equilibrium, which does not satisfy the basic positive economic goal of predicting outcomes. Okay? And, so, and so it should be very, very dissatisfactory, unsatisfactory, dissatisfying. Okay? It, 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 it assumes that people have, it makes all the same kind of assumptions about common rationality. It just doesn't actually, there are games in which this really elegant solution concept doesn't tell us what will actually happen. Okay? So this, to believe that there's actually predictive power, you have to add another assumption, which is that the players actually have the same belief about what will happen. Well, we always go to the opera, right? Or you have to add some other dimension to the game, like maybe the opera is actually closer for both of them. Yeah? Yeah, so, so you have to assume that player one would... Okay, so, this, so the, the most straightforward answer I can give you is, yes, that's right, but that's not actually the game. So we, there's ways that we can tweak this game to get a prediction. And one of them is to allow the players a second turn. You can now get up and leave. And I postulate people getting up and leaving as a way to show that there's no way for them to unilaterally deviate. But under, you can extend the game and complicate the game and say, well, what if, you get a, what if it's a multiple round game, right, where they get a second round, which is maybe you get to leave and see what the other person does. But I would argue that if, it, if a person decides to be irrational and get up and leave to go to football, in the next round, there's no better reason for us to think that the other player will follow them than to believe that they'll just go back. So you, have to, you wind up having to tweak either your solution concept and make it something more complicated than actual equilibrium, or you have to tweak the game itself in order, in order to get an actual prediction. And that's what game theorists do. Okay, so what I tried to do here is to show you, and let me, just, let me just say, actually, let me respond to your question in a different way that will sort of tie together the two different dimensions of preferences and beliefs that we're going to address here in the next three weeks, four weeks. We've got a situation here where these people like to be together, okay? But they like to be together for selfish reasons. I enjoy your company. It's not that they like to be together because I want you to be happy, okay? So we could, one of the ways we could tweak this game, let's see, what do we have? We, this was the guy, right, and this was the woman. Okay, so now having, having made that sort of like counter-stereotypical assignment of genders, I will now revert to stereotypical gender typing and say, what well, if the guy is perfectly selfish and the woman is altruistic? Okay, then they'll always wind up at football. So you can add not just that you, we, we were monkeying around with what if people have irrational uh, sort of beliefs or preferences over their own outcomes, and I'm saying, well, what if we deviate in a different way that might not be necessarily irrational, but that just introduces a new dimension of preferences, social preferences. She cares about his happiness. He doesn't care about her happiness. Right? It's the old story. Sorry, uh, in this case, they wind up at opera over again. Right? So I double reverted to, to stereotyping. I forgot my previous counter-stereotypical counter assignment. So there's these two dimensions uh, in, in behavioral economics that we, that we dig into. How do people feel about other people's outcomes and what kind of actual strategic thinking people do to solve games. And we can start by talking about social preferences. And then we'll come back around to looking at what if people don't, aren't, don't sort of solve games in this perfectly rational way. <clears throat> okay. So social preferences is a very general term. Okay. It doesn't mean you have a preference for being social um, or even necessarily that you like other people. It just is a way of capturing all of the different possible ways in which other people's outcomes or actions enter into your individual utility function. So this goes back to the conversation um, that we were having earlier about the possibility, one possibility is that I care about what you get, and another possibility is that I care about how you behave, right? even if it doesn't affect what either of us gets. I just saw you be a jerk to somebody else, I'm going to hurt myself to hurt you. I'm going to cross the street to slap you in the face. Okay, so most economic analysis assumes uh, self-interest narrowly defined, which means caring only about your own outcomes. And there's, we can have endless, by which I mean literally, uh, genuinely endless, because this is a completely bottomless pit, arguments about whether or not altruism is actually self-interested, right? Really, the reason I care about you is because it makes me feel better, and so ultimately all I really care about is me feeling better. This is not an interesting discussion. It does not inform anything. All we care about is, are you interested in your outcomes, or a combination of your outcomes and other, other people's outcomes, and the philosophical question of whether, it's, it's like discussing solipsism. There's no end to that discussion. So we just, we don't care about that. Here's Adam Smith, the classic statement of self-interest. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our necessities, but of their advantage, which is another way of saying markets rule. Okay? Not an outrageous assumption in many situations. It's clearly a realistic psychological view of a lot of human behavior. <clears throat> but it's not enough. Uh, and there's lots and lots of uh, economically important situations in which if we don't understand how people feel about other people's outcomes and other people's actions, we will predict the wrong thing and potentially impose the wrong public policy. Okay? And uh, so uh, this is just a silly little example. Um, this is banana bread. 
being sold by the side of the road in Hawaii. This is a cash box. This is actually a, this is the original of this was uh, somewhere in rural Pennsylvania, I think. Okay, a locked money box is there, bolted down to put money in, but anybody can come and take the bread. They don't actually have to put money in the box, right? So it's a balance of people's beliefs and people's social preferences and their beliefs about one another's social preferences. People seem to be nice enough to make this worthwhile enough to put money in the box when they take the banana bread, um, and people know that and believe it. The farmers or whoever they are making the banana bread, but also that some people can be selfish, which is why the uh, cash box is bolted down, right? And so, so this tells us something not only about people's preferences, but that there's heterogeneity in people's social preferences, and that other people seem to have a reasonably correct understanding of what the distribution of social preferences is. Um, and, uh, and you can sort of imagine what would happen if somebody was actually jerk enough to not just take the banana bread, but actually rip the cash box off the table. And you can imagine that the person who stands that is might revise their beliefs about the distribution of social preferences among their, uh, among their, their friends. Here's where I'll stop. I just want to say a couple of things about this next slide. So the next thing I'm going to start talking about is the ultimatum game, which is a way of a very simplistic way of studying how people feel about each other's outcomes. One person gets the opportunity to divide a pie between themselves and another person. They make an offer. Here, we'll split it 50-50. It's like I cut, you choose. Okay, the ultimatum game is I cut, you choose. If I split it 50-50, the other person then gets to decide whether to accept the offer or just reject it completely, and neither of us gets anything. Okay, so if I offer you a smaller slice, you might say pa and toss them both onto the floor. The point I want to just make before we before we wrap up is. We're, as soon as we start talking about social preferences, we're immediately going to be thrown back into game theory because game theory is how we study social preferences. And we're going to start with this very classical game, and I'll, I'll talk about it more on Tuesday. 